Good afternoon. It's Jeffrey Christian of CPM Group. It's about 1.52 on Friday afternoon, the 6th of October here in New York. I want to talk about the precious metals markets, where they are, what's happened over the last uh, few days, and especially this morning. Uh, I'll also talk a little bit about the jobs report, you know, what's going on in the bond market, and I'll touch on oil very briefly. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about the central bank activity um, in, in gold over the month. Mark, prices were very volatile this morning. We had a very strong jobs report. Uh, it was said to surprise the financial markets. We've, I think we've talked about it in the past that we don't put a lot of credence in banks and brokerage houses' projections of economic indicators that are coming out. Um, I'm not quite sure how the track record is, but having worked at a major investment bank and worked in the financial markets for more than 40 years, um, I, I have issues about the nature of the system used to produce such uh, projections. So we tend not to look at those projections and put much credence in them. We look at them, but we don't put much credence in them. So the uh, fact that the jobs report was twice as strong as uh, the Wall Street consensus does not necessarily mean much to us in terms of the real economic activity. What it does mean is that the real economic activity is very strong and uh, stronger than people have been expecting, including CPM Group. Uh, and that has implications for higher interest rates longer, which has implications for everything from stocks and bonds to housing to commodities to precious metals. This morning, you know, as I as I'm speaking, the last time I looked uh, in preparing my notes, the price of gold was around one thousand eight hundred thirty-seven dollars an ounce. It had gotten as low as eighteen twenty-three uh, after the jobs report was released this morning, and then it sprung back, got up as high as eighteen forty-five. Talk a little bit about the outlook later. Uh, silver. About 21.44, the rain it got it, it was it fell to 20.94 after the jobs report sprung back up. It got up as 21 uh, high as 21.65, and uh, as I said right now, it's around 21.44. Um, platinum 8.70, it fell down to 8.56 got back up to 874. It's around 870 right now. And palladium, it's 1,153. It had dropped down as low as 1,137, sprung back $30, and now it's right there in the middle of it all. Um, so that's that. I will talk more about the jobs and bonds and stocks later. These this is the an index of the precious metals prices, gold, silver, platinum, and palladium, since the beginning of the year, or rather since the last trading day of 2022. Um, this and all of the charts that I'm using on precious metals prices are from CPM Group's uh, October Precious Metals Advisory, which we released last night. Um, this is an index of the precious metals prices. You can see gold at the top has fared much better than silver, platinum, palladium. Silver, platinum, palladium are more industrial metals. Gold is much more of a financial asset and a portfolio diversifier and a hedge. Uh, and given the state of the financial market's attitudes toward the economy, they have been worried about a recession and they have probably underpriced silver, platinum, and palladium based on that. Uh, and there has been some weakness in platinum and palladium um, and silver um, prices that well get back to the, our outlook in a little bit gold has held up better because of economic concerns uh, and issues as well as political issues if you look at gold it had been trading really holding above 1900 for most of this year it had been it started the year below that oh it started the year at 1900 spiked up uh, came back off later in the first quarter, got back up to a record price in the uh, second quarter, and it's been trending lower, but it had held about 1920 or 1900 for most of the year until like last week, and then it broke down. And it's basically been a matter of strength, 
strengthening economic expectation in the financial markets. The fact that it's not just gold or gold and silver, but that you've seen the same price pattern in other commodities and in stocks and in bonds and other financial assets tell you that what we're really seeing are reactions to financial market expectations of economic and political trends. But gold prices have fallen off. As I said, they got down as low as 1823 this morning. Uh, our expectation is that the prices will probably bottom out. I wouldn't be surprised to see 1820, 1823 uh, tested again. 1820 has been our downside target since the price started to break down. Uh, we got within $3 of it today. Uh, we wouldn't be surprised to see some further weakness in the next week or two in the gold price and in other precious metals prices. But then again, we're expecting prices to, to pick up in November and December of this year and into the first quarter of next year. There is fundamental fabrication and investment demand uh, that kicks in at that time of year, this time of year, really starting. Uh, gold jewelry, um, jewelry manufacturers start buying gold for year-end gift giving. And then the Lunar New Year kicks in in the first quarter of, of next year. And you tend to see gold demand for both investment purposes and for jewelry pick up during that period of time. So there's some seasonal strength. In addition to that, we think that some of the um, euphoria about economic conditions will probably be deteriorating over that, that four-month period, five-month period of time from, say, late October through the first quarter of the year. Uh, we think that there has been a shift, which we've seen from uh, financial consensus that we were in a recession already in 2023 to, oh, we're going to have a soft landing. And the CPM Group's view is that, no, we weren't going to have a recession in 2023. One's likely in 2024 or 2025. Um, and we still think that there's one that's likely in 2024, 2025. We don't believe that we will see a soft landing period of weak economic activity followed by rejuvenated expansion. We think that there will be a recession. We think that over the next five or six months, you will see the financial market consensus shift back toward concerns about economic strength going forward. Today's jobs report and the reaction of the markets in assuming higher interest rates for longer factors into that view. And we think that that's going to be happening over the next five, six months. In addition to that, you have the U.S. political election cycle, which will be gearing up over the remainder of this year and during the first quarter of next year. It's going to be very uh, abrasive, to use a nice use of euphemism, I guess. And, and, and we think that that could um, also add to investment demand for gold in the United States and around the world. And then there are a host of other political issues and economic issues around the world that we think will be causing investors to step up their gold demand, pushing prices higher. Silver probably will trace gold to some extent. It is more of an industrial metal. Uh, it had um, lag gold somewhat. We think that Investors in most parts of the world are focusing more on gold than on silver because, again, they see it more as a financial asset and a quasi-currency and a safe haven. Some people see silver in those, that land, lane light. We do, too. Uh, so we do think that silver has some more downside over the next few weeks, but that by November, December, early next year, we think the silver price will be rising. We're not looking for $1,000 like that guy on the Internet uh, yesterday, uh, but we wouldn't be surprised to see the price back up around $26 by early next year. And we do think that the price has the scope to rise more sharply if we're right and we see a more hostile economic and political environment over the course of 2024. Platinum and palladium are more related to the auto industry. You have seen some weakness uh, recently. You have a strike in the big three auto companies in the United States, which is temp reducing temporary and immediate demand for platinum, palladium, rhodium, 
in the auto manufacturing process, that's a relatively minor thing. You have had platinum prices and palladium and rhodium prices hold up by concerns about load shedding by ESCOM, the state uh, electricity company in South Africa. That load shedding is now, com they're coming out of their winter. The supply demand balance of electricity is shifting in a more positive way. And ESCOM thinks that the idea of more problematic load shedding uh, power distribution is diminishing. So investors are becoming less concerned about electricity causing disruption, supply causing disruptions in South African platinum production. And that adds to the downside pressure on uh, platinum, palladium, and rhodium use in the automobiles and supply. So we do think that platinum prices, we thought they held above $900, $880. They're now down to 870 having touched 856 earlier this morning. We would expect the price, it could spike down to $800. Uh, we don't think that it will. We think that it finds a base probably around where we are right now, maybe a little bit lower, 18, 850, uh, and then starts to move higher later in the year and into next year. And palladium has also been suffering, and it has now broken down below 1200 and it got down as low as $1,137. Palladium is suffering from the same concerns about automotive demand as is platinum, uh, but it also is uh, seeing shifting demand away from palladium into platinum. And there still is, you know, a $150, $200 price uh, advantage if you can use an ounce of platinum instead of an ounce of palladium. So platinum still has a cost advantage for automakers and other fabricators that you can use either metal and that probably is going to add weight on the downside for palladium prices. Turning to the bond market, I saw a interview this morning with somebody saying this was the biggest bond market collapse in history, and then it was shocking. Shouldn't have shocked anyone. Everyone could see it coming. We had 14, 15 years of zero interest rate policy. We started moving away from that 18 months ago. It was quite clear what was going to happen. If interest rates are going to rise, the prices of bonds are going to fall. But people were comparing this in percentage terms to what happened in 1979, 1981, when Paul Volcker took over the Fed and said, we're going to stop targeting interest rates, and we're going to target inflation. We're going to squeeze inflation out of the system. Now, if you look at this chart, you can see that the 10-year bond rate was already 9% when Paul took over the Fed in October of 1979. It went from 9% to 21%. That's really high, going to even higher. In 2020. 1, 22, 23, it went from 0%, well, less than 1%, to about 5% right now. About 4.9, I think, is the uh, uh, rate uh, for 10-year uh, treasury notes right now. So bigger percentage move, but moving to a level that is half of what it was at the start of the bond market price decline interest rate increase in 1979. So to compare what's going on now in the interest rate markets to what was going on in the 1970s when the Fed was targeting interest rates as opposed to inflation, or the late 70s, early 80s, when the Fed was saying we've got to crush this inflation because it's very detrimental for the U.S. economy as well as the government and everybody else. Um, it's just a completely different market, a completely different world. And you can't compare one to the other and say, well, this is a gigantic collapse. First off, it's not a collapse. It's been going on for 18 months in a relatively orderly fashion. Second thing is interest rates have risen all this way back up to 
the lowest levels that they were from the 1950s until 2008. So it's not that catastrophic. And it's probably not going to cause a major recession. Recession will come, but not because of interest rates. Recession's coming for other reasons that are quite obvious in the real economy and in fiscal policy. Um, it's just not that big of an issue. I've got some notes over here that I wanted to make sure that I keep that all, that I get all my thoughts in order. The two-year, 10-year Treasury uh, yield curve got down to negative 1.06 at the end of June. The interest rate earned that you could earn on a two-year Treasury uh, note was 1.06% higher than what tends. But we've seen is that short rates have held relatively steady, but the 10-year and 30-year note and bond have risen sharply. And as of this morning or this afternoon, the spread was down to 28 basis points. The, the two-year note is still more higher yield than the 10-year, but you've lost 72% of that spread over the course of Ju July, August, and September. So that tells you that the financial markets, or at least some part of the financial markets, is saying, okay, we have a stronger economy, a stronger dollar, a stronger U.S. economy than we had expected. And that gets reflected in borrowing on a longer-term basis. And the fact that short rates have not been rising but have been relatively flat, around 5.3%, tells you that the financial markets also believe that the central banks are close to, if not at, the peak of their interest rate rising cycle. Fed policy affects short rates. Short-term rates have risen, and short-term rates have risen more sharply than long-term rates because that's where the Fed's policy has the greatest effect. If you look at the return across 11 asset classes in the third quarter, again, the best returns were in Treasury bills, 90-day Treasury bills. And that's been the case really since they started raising interest rates. Um, so the yield curve sort of presage the, uh, the shift that the financial markets were coming to understand that the, the economy was stronger than they had given it credit for being. Oil prices, meanwhile, you know, a week ago they were $92 a barrel, and there were pundits on the internet waving their arms saying that we're going to be at $100 oil or $140 oil, you know, by Halloween. And today the price is $82. Okay. Ten, you know, it's off about $10 in, 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 in a matter of days. Let's talk a little about central banks. In August, central banks bought about 2.6 million ounces of gold on a net basis. Now, China was the largest purchaser, less than a million ounces. Uh, but Russia also bought some, Uzbekistan, Poland, Australia. There are several countries that bought a few hundred thousand ounces. You see that gross purchases of 1.92, and then the gross sales as we measure it and as the IMF measures it was a negative 590. What that means is that some central banks that were net sellers in the first seven months of the year actually bought back some of that gold or bought back gold in August. So if you look at the first eight months, you can see gross purchases of 12.9 million ounces, gross sales of 5.5 million ounces, and net purchases of about 7.4. The only central bank that was buying, selling gold in August was Mexico, and that was just a small amount for um, coins, uh, coin, coin issuance. So what we're seeing is that we did have this period of time in the early part of the year 
when Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, and Turkey were selling gold reserves because they needed foreign exchange reserves for trade settlement purposes. That's behind the market. So the big sellers of earlier this year are gone, but the big buyers of this year are still there. And China is probably up at around 4.9, maybe a little bit over 5 million ounces that they have bought now in the first eight months of this year. And you saw China, the People's Bank of China, come in as a buyer in November and December of last year, buying a million ounces in each of those months. And that was after the price had fallen from $2,100 to um, $1,624. So they had watched like a 20% decline in the price of gold to $1,624 on November 9th. And they said, okay, it's not 1300 which is like where we were buying in 2019, but it's 20% lower than the peaks that we've seen in 2020, 2021, and early 2022. So let's start buying again. So it looks more positive for net central bank buying for gold, but it's a measured thing. It's not they're dumping the dollar and, and racing into gold. It's a very measured thing. And central banks, generally speaking, with the exception of Russia, tend to be extremely price sensitive. That's all I have for now. I've gone on longer than I wanted to. I'm sorry about that. Uh, but there's a lot to cover in the markets today. Have a good weekend. Take care of yourself. Take care of people around you. Try to go out and do something good for the world on the weekend. And we'll talk to you next Tuesday.